All right. So I was uh, asked to talk a little bit about um, spinal ischemia re related to endovascular and open repair. Mostly I'm going to talk about endovascular repair as that's kind of the topic. Uh, and obviously many of the things that we do whenever we perform open repair with thoracic or thoracic abdominal aneurysm some apply to some degree. So spinal cord ischemia is pretty rare, but devastating complication of T-bar very much as um, a retrograde dissection uh, is in many of our patients. Its incidence is extremely variable in the open surgical literature from 3 to 15%, while the risk after T-bar is much lower. And it's somewhere in the 2 to 3% range and maybe even lower depending on the patients that you're talking about and you're treating. If you look at uh, some of the prospective data uh, comparing this is from the uh, TAG study. TAG and open repair, the paraplegia and paraparesis rates were significantly different, 3% on the endovascular arm and 14% on the open surgical arm. And in further more advanced studies or more recent studies, the incidence has continued to decrease, and it's somewhere around the 2% range in the majority of the studies that have been published. Obviously, the perfusion to the spinal cord is critical, and there are multiple collateral pathways that perfuse the spinal cord from the branches of the subclavian artery and the vertebral artery to all the branches of the aorta and the hypogastric arteries in a retrograde fashion, and all of them can be quite important. As there's multiple communications between all these collaterals around the spinal cord, and they can perfuse a significant area of the spinal cord, hopefully limiting the risk for this uh, devastating complication. So some of the information and some of the publications here from the Mount Sinai cardiothoracic group has uh, um, looked at very carefully at the risk of paraplegia in patients after thoracoabdominal aneurysm. And some of the uh, data has suggested that no single intercostal is absolutely necessary for spinal cord integrity. And there's clearly a ne network of multiple collaterals that allow for sacrifice of several feeding vessels with very limited risks, especially when you're treating patients in an endovascular fashion. It appears that the risk for paraplegia increases more significantly when a large number of intercostals, in their experience, more than 10 pairs are sacrificed and then the risk of paraplegia increases. So what are the mechanisms of spinal cord ischemia? When you're talking about open repair, clearly a segment of blood supply that's discontinuous and it's affected by the procedure becomes a problem, and the length of the replacement directly is related to the incidence of paraplegia. It's important to keep in mind that the spinal cord perfusion pressure equals the mean blood pressure minus the CSF pressure, so that anything we can do to increase that perfusion pressure is beneficial to this group of patients. That can be affected by aortic cross clamping and many other medications that are given throughout the procedure, be open or endovascular. Systemic hypotension will affect the patients, as you can imagine, and reperfusion injury, depending on the complexity of the procedure, will also affect it. Some of the mechanisms associated with uh, the development of spinal cord ischemia in patients after TVAR is more about the coverage of critical intercostals and other branches that can lead to immediate or sometimes even longer term paraplegia. Uh, fortunately, in patients that are treated with TVAR, episodes of hypotension are relatively rare, but whenever those happen, those will increase the risk of paraplegia as well as delayed thrombosis and potential embolization from manipulations to be able to complete the procedure. And patients with a diseased thoracic aorta may increase the risk for paraplegia in that patient population. If you're covering a short segment of the thoracic aorta, as it's been shown in multiple trials, in particular those for uh, traumatic lesions, the risk of spinal cord ischemia is very low whenever a very short segment of the thoracic aorta is covered, and especially if you're covering the uh, more proximal uh, descending thoracic aorta, the risk is very low. Obviously, when you're covering a short segment but of the distal thoracic aorta, the risk is relatively low but maybe a little bit higher since some of the critical branches and critical collaterals may be coming off of the aorta in those segments. So when should you consider the use of adjuncts to decrease the risk of spinal cord ischemia in this patient population? Uh, for many of the publications, if you have extensive thoracic aortic coverage, that's one group that you should consider it. Patients with prior aortic replacements where lumbars and intercostal vessels have already been occluded or replaced, and a compromised collateral network when you're starting to consider branches from the hypogastrics, the subclavian, and other branches that may be the main perfusion to the spinal cord in that particular patient, that may be an issue. And there's some discussion of patients with aortic dissections that have sheared some of the critical branches, maybe at a higher risk for the development of spinal cord ischemia. 
So most patients that undergo TVAR are at relatively low risk, fortunately, of this devastating complication. But as we're expanding the utilization of fenestrated endovascular graft, branch graft, um, combinations of snorkels, and extensive coverage of the thoracic and abdominal aorta, the risk of spinal cord ischemia may continue to increase in that patient population. And that has been suggested for multiple series of experience centers. So if you start looking at the data regarding the risk of spinal cord ischemia in patients undergoing endovascular therapy, this is from some of the data from the Cleveland Clinic from Matt Eagleton and his group. Uh, if they're looking at their data from 1998 to 2010, over 1,200 aneurysms were treated in a vascular fashion, and in their hands, they had a relatively low spinal cord ischemia uh, rate of approximately 2.8%. But if you divide it in different types of patients, really the ones that have thoracic aneurysms treated and thoracoabdominal aneurysms treated had the higher risk for this complication. Patients that have juxtarenal aneurysms and infrarenal aneurysms were at relatively low risk uh, of having this type of a complication. If you separate those patients a little bit more, in patients with type 4 or juxtarenal aneurysms that were treated endovascular, the risk was low, only 1.2%. But in patients that had a type 4 thoracoabdominal aneurysm treated in an endovascular fashion, it seemed that as you covered more of the distal thoracic aorta, and in their experience, if you went from 33 millimeters to 53 millimeters, that already started to make the difference in the rate of um, spinal cord ischemia they saw in their patient population. In patients that uh, had type 2 and type 3 thoracoabdominals be done with FIVAR or BVAR, the risk of permanent uh, spinal cord ischemia appeared to be 4% or higher in some of the subgroups, as uh, I'll show you here. In, they also looked at some of the data in patients that had the more extensive type 2 thoracoabdominal aneurysms treated in the vascular fashion in different matters. They had 87 patients. They treated them at a single stage and two stage, and a number of them were staged, but it was unintentionally. And if you look at the risk of spinal cord ischemia in those patients, the patients treated with a single stage had a risk of um, spinal cord ischemia approximately 37%, while the ones that had a two-stage procedure intentionally or unintentionally had a significantly lower rate at approximately 11%. So in patients with very complex thoracoabdominal aneurysms treated in an endovascular fashion, a stage repair may be of significant benefit in that group of patients. So what can we do to prevent spinal cord ischemia, at least for patients with open thoracoabdominal aneurysms, there are a number of things that we can do and have been done in uh, centers with a significant amount of experience, including CSF drainage, neuromonitoring can lead to other interventions to diminish the risk, maintaining the blood pressure, maintaining the collateral pathways as they have been identified. Some people will use hypothermia to be able to support these patients, retrograde aortic perfusion to maintain perfusion to distal collaterals, and selective intercostal reimplantation, depending on the findings you have during the procedure, be changes on the neuromonitoring at the time of the procedure, or, or branches that you see that are large and considered critical can be reimplanted at that time. To be able to prevent it in patients with um, endovascular repair, the number of options that we have are a little more limited. CSF drainage is still considered to be very helpful in this patient population. Neuromonitoring monitoring may or may not be helpful as far as guiding the management if there are changes at the time of the procedure being performed. Maintaining blood pressure is clearly important as well as maintaining all the collateral pathways that are noted in the preoperative evaluation and during the procedure. So CSF drainage appears to be a benefit and has been shown to be a benefit for patients that undergo open repair. And it carries usually a low complication rate, and it's a very reasonable procedure to try to diminish the risk of uh, complications in our endovascular patients too. The complication rate for CSF drainage is quite low. Um, in the experience of uh, centers that perform a significant number of both thoracoabdominal open and endovascular procedures with CSF leaks being some of the problems and headaches. Intracranial hemorrhage is relatively low at less than half of a percent in this particular experience. So watch patients are excluded, and it's mainly patients that are treated with, in an emergency fashion or that have a very short coverage of the thoracic aorta, like patients that undergo, that have trauma. All the patients that have an active infection or other particular problems may not be candidates for the use of CSF drainage in particular. In general, it's uh, inserted through the midline or the paramedian uh, approach, 
at the L3, L4, L5 levels, a catheter is placed and intraoperative drainage is maintained to keep the pressure low on those patients. And then it's maintained through the post-operative period. When you're talking about the use of drainage in patients with TVAR, it's not very clear for how long to maintain it in different institutions. They follow different protocols as far as the length in that patient population. But if the patient develops any neurological deficits, protocols, protocols like this one, the COPS protocol, to maintain CSF draining and increase it for a short period of time, oxygen delivery, and elevating the blood pressure and maintaining the support in those patients are very critical to try to reverse some of the neurological deficits that occur. And it's been shown that with some of these maneuvers, uh, deficits that are found acutely can be reversed in that patient population. So neuromonitoring can be helpful. It's not as sensitive, not very sensitive, but it's quite specific. And if you have the opportunity of making changes during the procedure based on neuromonitoring, it may be helpful to a selected group of patients. From a surgical fashion, anesthesia can help from that standpoint as much as the surgeon may be prompted to intercostal reimplantation and changing some of the procedure uh, as they're performing it. If the procedure is being performed in the vascular fashion, we have a number of um, things that we can do, but they're somewhat more limited. And it's mainly raising the blood pressure and lowering the pressure on the CSF space by draining more through the CSF drainage catheter or placing one if the patient didn't have one. So specific additional measures useful in extensive procedures is to limit the extent of the coverage if at all possible, maintain the collaterals, be the subclavian or the internal iliac arteries, stage the procedures in an endovascular fashion if appropriate. Some people have suggested that maintaining a small endo leak and coming back later to replace, to repair it may be an option in those patients that have extensive thoracoabdominal repairs in an endovascular fashion. So in conclusion, spinal cord ischemia is a devastating complication, but fortunately, it's quite rare. And adjunctive measures are not necessary for the majority of the patients that are going TVAR, but if you have significant concerns in extensive in patients that require extensive coverage, this can be very helpful in addition to the other maneuvers. Thank you very much.